while you're turning to the book of Joshua in the 14th chapter of that good book, I'd like to give you these words. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That appearing in the 11th chapter of the Hebrew letter and verse 6. And certainly today we're going to spend some time looking at a man who knew what that kind of faith was about. Who knew how to let God use him that he might please God. His name is Caleb. And his story appears throughout the history books of the Old Testament. And in Joshua chapter 14, he makes a statement about his faith that we'll be laboring on today. These are the areas which the children of Israel inherited in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel distributed as an inheritance to them. So they've crossed the Jordan River. They're in the land of milk and honey. The promise of Abraham is coming to fruition to a point at this period of time. And the land is being divided up among the Israelites according to the 12 tribes. And this is the scene that we visit today. Their inheritance was by lot, as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses, for the nine tribes and the half tribe. For Moses had given the inheritance of the two tribes and the half tribe on the other side of the Jordan. But to the Levites he had given no inheritance among them. For the children of Israel were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, the children of Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim, and they gave no part to the Levites in the land except cities to dwell in with their common lands for their livestock and their property. As the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did, and they divided the land. Then the children of Judah came to Joshua in Gilgal, And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know the word which the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, concerning you and me in Kadesh Barnea. I was forty years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought back word to him as it was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land where your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these forty-five years, ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am this day, eighty-five years old. As yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me, just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there, and that the cities were great and fortified. It may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him, and gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, as an inheritance." Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel, and our reading will end there. As we develop this scene, you must understand as the inheritance of Canaan is being divided up among the Israelites, that there's one particular territory that's seen as kind of nasty, And nobody wants that place. It's a beautiful place, Mount Hebron. But the problem is the Anakim live there. And they have fortified cities. And the cities are great. 
And I guess Israel is somewhat intimidated by the land and the cities and the fortifications, but they're more so intimidated by this. The people of that region were like giants. We'll read about them in Numbers. We read about them in the book of Deuteronomy. We'll spend some time in those places today. But basically what's happening is, as they're taking lots and they're dividing up the land, it appears that no one wants to go fight the Anakim and take Hebron. And Caleb says, I'll take that mountain. Give that mountain to me. I believe the Lord will be with me and I'll, I'll run out the people from the land. I can do it. I'll stand for the truth. I'll let God work through me. I'll glorify God. I'll go to war with these people and drive them off that mountain and I'll take it. It's a great story of one man's faith and his ability to allow God to work through that faith that God might be pleased. Hebrews 11 verse 6. One of the things that makes it a great story is when we leave the historical perspective and we get to the personal application. For it's through the courage of people like Caleb that we're challenged to be like him, to follow his example and to bring glory to God simply by what we believe and allowing that faith to be converted through our lifestyle. First, let's look at some things about Hebron. You see it on the map there on the screen. If you look at the red star right smack in the middle of the map, that's the region of Hebron. It's in the middle of Judah, approximately. It's approximately halfway between the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And it's known in the Bible to be a beautiful place. It is a place of some Bible lore. It appears to have been Abraham's favorite place long ago where his wife Sarah died and was buried. Genesis 23. Genesis, Genesis writes about Abraham pitching his tents in Hebron underneath the giant trees there. It must have been a, a place where the cattle could roam and eat and where there was plenty of fresh water because Abraham, a rancher, could not possibly have existed without those things. It was also later David's royal residence when he became king, 2 Samuel 5, 5. He spent seven and a half years there before moving his headquarters 20 miles north to Jerusalem. But Hebron, before that, was first known for being the home of the descendants of Anak, a people great and tall, if you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Before we continue our study in the Old Testament, I'd like to revisit a couple of New Testament policies that we're seeing unfold today, and this will help us with the application. First of all, in Matthew 15, 19, the Bible says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. As you look at that list of sins, we're talking about some pretty major sins there. Murders and adulteries and sexual immorality and blasphemies. But notice the first sin listed, evil thoughts. I believe the Bible the Word of God takes more seriously some sins than others. We might be sort of passive about this sin, but God is not. In Revelation 21, verses 7 and 8, He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Notice the same thing here that we picked out in Matthew 15. This list of rather atrocious sins by our standard 
is being led by the cowardly, followed by the unbelieving. And it's from these two scriptures that we learn the following. First of all, it is a sin not to believe God. When God says the territory, Canaan, can be taken and man doesn't believe that, that's an evil thought. Because God told you you can take it. And you said, well, maybe somebody can take it, but I can't. That's a sin against God because you didn't believe the truth. It's also sinful to not have the courage to stand up for the truth. And as we note the first two sins in Revelation 21, they are the cowardly and unbelieving. Now, I don't know that because they're listed in this order, God is more sensitive toward those sins than he is sorcerers and, and murderers and so forth. But you can clearly see that's the way he mentioned them. So we need to be serious about these sins that we somehow might think, well, they're not as bad as murder. It's not as bad as sorcery, is it? The fact that I'm, I'm a coward when it comes to teaching the gospel to the lost. It's not as bad as having evil thoughts regarding the truth, is it? If I don't believe in God. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. That's how important it is to believe. Luke 1 verse 20, concerning the birth of John the Baptist, the angel of the Lord is speaking here to Zacharias, but behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their own time. I believe God takes belief pretty seriously. He sent an angel of the Lord to Zacharias to prophesy about the coming of a, a divine child, John the Baptist. I don't believe Elizabeth, his mother, I don't believe her, her stomach is getting big yet, or you'd always already see the evidence of that. So I'm just going to guesstimate that she's maybe seven to nine months away from delivering birth. And because you didn't believe the angel of the Lord, you get to spend that whole time deaf and mute. That's pretty serious punishment for a guy who what? Murdered? No. Committed idolatry? No. He's an adulterer? No. He's just guilty of not believing what God said. We need to be as serious about this as God wants us to be. John 3, 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. It is indeed a sin to not believe in the words that God gives us. And this is what separates men like Caleb and Joshua from those unbelieving cowards who said we can't take it. Numbers chapter 13. I know you know the story. Let's look at Deuteronomy 9 verses 1 through 4. Because it's quite significant this word that Caleb believes. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourself, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you 
Now we've got some good material to work on. Why is God going to drive them out? Not because of my righteousness. Because if I had to count on my righteousness, I might be a little suspect here because I know me pretty well. And we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And I've got some serious reasons to suspect that I'm not good enough for God to work through me. And therefore I lack confidence or I lack faith to believe that God can work through me like this. Because after all, when I do an inventory and look at these people, they're giant people. They live in this land. And, and the land must have been very valuable, Sister Caraway. Common sense will tell us that. You great, big, talented people, you can have any land you want. Everybody's afraid of you. Just go into Canaan and take the spot you want. You can whip anybody there is. Okay, we'll take Mount Hebron. We'll build our encampment there. We'll build fortified cities and settle that place. That tells you it must have been a fertile land. It must have been a desirable place. Let the short people who don't have any talent take the land somewhere else. Let them take the rocky terrain and have a hard time carving out a living. We're big bullies. We're the 800 pound gorilla in the elementary school. We'll take whatever we want and we want Hebron. Okay. So the people of Israel are going to be dealing with this emotional issue. We've got to go in and take a land that looks to us like it can't be taken by us. And I don't have any confidence in myself because I'm not a righteous man. I know the law of God. I know how many times I'm required to go to the altar and offer sacrifices. Even the priests under the old law had to offer sacrifices for their sins during the week before they could lead the people in a holy and reverent um, uh, act of worship toward God on the Sabbath. But here's what happens, Israel. It's not about your righteousness. It's about their wickedness. Do you see how wicked these people are? That's your telltale sign. That's why God's going to use you to wipe them out. Because they worship idols. Because they're pagans. Because they're just sinful, sin-sick, wicked people. You can see that just as clearly as you can see the different colors on the cars in the parking lot. You couldn't be wrong to say, that's a silver one, that's a white one. These people are wicked. It's because of their wickedness, not your righteousness, that God's going to drive them out of the land. You can have confidence and faith in God because of what you see from these people. It makes all the sense in the world. If there was ever a biblical hero who demonstrated courage by living what he believed, it was Caleb. Relentlessly confident, he had the uncanny ability to stay close to God and the holy nerve to approach Joshua and say, Give me this mountain, Hebron, of which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the giant like the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. Caleb is saying, okay, we're choosing up sides. We're drawing lots. I'll take the hardest area to take. I'll take the fight that no one else wants to fight. I'll be like David and the Goliath in 1 Samuel 17, many years later, I'll have that kind of faith. God said he would give it to me. That means he's going to give it to me. I'll take Hebron. Can you turn to Numbers real quick? In chapter 13. Verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses because of the report the ten spies brought that we can't take it. 
Numbers 13, 30. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. You see how positive he is? You see the faith of Caleb? But the men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, so we were in their sight. They've seen many people, and they've come to the conclusion uh, like this. All these people are bigger and better than we are, but we're only going to mention one people by name, the Anak. That's really a troublesome spot. I don't feel good about what's going on up north. You can go just to the west of the Jordan River. I, that, I, that's a tough land. That, that, all these lands are tough. But let me tell you, the most difficult of all places to capture will be where the giants live. Hebron don't want anything to do with that place. But Caleb was ready even at the age of 85. Five years older than our own David Welch. You know what a tough physical specimen he is. He says, I, I'm a used to and a has been. But I'm going to have to rebuke him today because we don't find that in the Bible, do we? Caleb was 85. And he's still ready to jump on the horse and ride. I'm still ready to serve. I'm still ready to believe. I'm still ready to fight. I'm still ready to have courage. Although some intimidating obstacles stood in his way, his unwavering faith in God overshadowed every hindrance. And we close our lesson in the next few minutes by moving along to this point just as important. That same vigorous faith and unfailing courage can be ours today. We may not have the body of Caleb when we get to be 85, but we can still have the soul. We can still have the faith. We can still be doing the work of God. We need the courage to believe. Faith grows best sometimes in the dark when we have to put our trust in God rather than in what we see. Faith is not the absence of fear or even doubt. Rather, it is stepping out in courage to live the victory that is ours in Christ, that he might be glorified. And we're going to look at some things that we need to, to think about today. And that's the first one. We need the courage to believe in this dark and unsettling world. We need the courage to forgive. Taking an eraser to our hearts and minds it's not easy sometimes, is it? Ephesians chapter 4, it's on the screen, verses 30 through 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another just as God in Christ forgave you. It takes courage to do that. It takes faith to do that, doesn't it? Especially if you have Christian family members and, and members in Cherry Sink. If, I don't think we have that problem much, but you might have somebody who sins against you and sins against you again and sins against you again, and it takes faith to step up and do what God wants us to do. We have to have the courage to believe, and we also need the courage to forgive one another when we sin. We need the courage to tell others about Jesus Christ. Those first two points might not have hurt you too bad, but this one is likely to. Because we're probably the quietest bunch of Christians that have ever come down the pike. It's such a difficult world. That's the Anakites. But people will hate me if I preach Jesus. People will persecute me if I share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm likely to run into all kinds of problems and enemies and pain. And I don't want all those things. That's what Caleb overcame. Our Lord teaches us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. 
It takes courage to live the gospel, yet the truth of God's word changes lives for eternity, just as Jesus never missed an opportunity to share heaven's message of salvation we should follow his example. When we have an opportunity to make an internal impact on someone's life, let us have the faith of Caleb and capture that mountain and let God use us to bring a soul to him if possible. Everywhere those first century brethren of ours went, they went preaching the gospel. They were scattered and they went preaching the word. They went all over the world preaching the word. We need the courage to tell others about Jesus Christ. That's our tribe of giants, isn't it? That's our mountain that needs to be conquered. To have the faith and the courage to open up that mouth about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, look at the opportunities that God gives us. Grocery stores, Walmarts, it doesn't matter where you go in the public, you can always see someone. We have so many challenges and opportunities to take the mountain today. Give me that mountain, like Caleb said. I'll take it. I'm not afraid of the Anakites. I don't care how big they are. I've got the gospel message of God's great love for these lost souls. We need the courage to tell others about that. And lastly, we need the courage to overcome 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. You know, in all those situations in the book of Acts, <coughs> whether it was Paul or Peter, or John, whoever, God rescued his people from every one of those dangers. Even in Acts 12, when James was put to death by the sword, where do you think the soul of James went after that execution? It takes courage to climb our personal mountains, ladies and gentlemen. It was no accident that Caleb conquered his mountain. He spent 85 years learning how to. Living courageously for the Lord, watching the Lord work, and therein lies the principles for all of us to live what we believe. Let's have the courage to let our faith affect the way we perceive life and let our faith in God shape us that we seemingly conquer the impossible obstacles that God sends our way. God was faithful to Caleb. And he'll be faithful to us too. Let's look for our mountains that need to be taken. If we have anyone subject to the invitation, we want to help you with any spiritual need you might have this morning. If you're willing and have that need, please come to the front while together.